Welcome to the Nobody Guide to Life, where we provide tips and tools for personal growth, personal development, and your spiritual journey that you can use right now in your everyday life. I'm J.A. Plosker. You can always find out more at the thenobodyguidetolife.com, or you can check us out at Twitter and Facebook at Nobody's You, or join our Facebook group, Simple Spirituality. Thank you for joining us. As you know, we like to take a look on this show at what folks in the ancient traditions around the world are doing as we move through the calendar and to see if there are things we can learn from those ancient amazing practices that that we can apply right now on our own journeys of personal and spiritual growth. Now, for listeners of the show, you know that was the theme of, of my book, The Nobody Bible, and it's something I carry with me all the time. I'm always paying attention to that calendar, to those practices, to see what amazing things we can apply right now. Well, it just so happens that our Jewish friends around the world recently completed their holiest time of the year, what are known as the High Holidays, the 10 powerful days that start with Rosh Hashanah and end with Yom Kippur. Now, those 10 pillars of power are called the Days of Awe or the 10 Days of Repentance. So Rosh Hashanah marks the start of the Jewish New Year, and and it is in many ways a holiday of contrasts. It's a time to celebrate a new beginning. Yes, there's a custom of dipping apples in honey to represent uh, hope for a sweet new year. And we all love new beginnings. And there's something really exciting about getting the chance to start over, beginning again. It feels like new opportunities. But this time of year also takes on a somber mood. Why? Because many who celebrate also remember the year that's passed. It's a time to look back, take stock, to see where we can improve, much like a lot of people do on the January 1st, start of that new year. That means looking at things that maybe didn't go so well, places where we may have fallen short, things we meant to do but didn't get around to doing. I I guess in a lot of ways, it's probably like sitting on the couch on Sunday night and looking at that to-do list that never quite got done on the weekend. When that happens, there's this feeling that a new week is about to begin, full of promise, but behind us is a reminder that maybe we didn't quite do what we set out to do through the week, and now we're kind of thinking it through and maybe wishing we had more time or could do it over again. So if you've ever been to one of these holy holy day services, maybe you've heard someone blow into a, a ram's horn. So that's called a shofar. And it's meant to wake you up to get on this new journey and to use the days to the best of your ability. So think of it like an alarm that you set last year in case you fell spiritually asleep. Well, guess what? It's going off now and it's time to wake up. Other customs state that it's blown now because it was blown on Mount Sinai when Moses received the Torah or holy teachings from God. And you know, there's just something about a loud blast like that in any setting. It can fill you with emotion. I guess it's the same as hearing a choir singing mass or something like that. You feel small and empowered at the same time. It's it's, it's a really interesting feeling. Anyway, Rosh Hashanah kicks off those 10 days of awe we just talked about, the repentance days. Many believe that in those days, God is writing names into a book, deciding who will live and who will die, or who will have blessings in the coming year and who won't be so so lucky. Now, that book of names can sound scary, but fortunately, what people do in the intervening days before Yom Kippur can change the judgment. So on Rosh Hashanah, the book gets written, but it's not sealed until Yom Kippur. So if you've ever written a book, you know it's not final until you submit it to your publisher, or click publish, or however you decided to publish. And for most of us, that process took a lot longer than 10 days. But we're talking about a pretty powerful author here, so I guess anything's possible. So a lot of people ask for forgiveness from one another at this time. So if you can make things right, so much the better. So Yom Kippur is about clearing the sins, I guess, between a person and God. But when it comes to clearing wrongs you've done to other people, well, you have to take that one on yourself if you want to get really clean. Now, I don't think this means... You get to be jerky all year and then send out an apology text to everybody. You can't just say, my bad. So at some level, you really have to go in, see where an improvement can be made, and stand behind the apology. Or else, well, on that day after Yom Kippur, people still won't like you, and you may not really clear the slate. But then again, I've read some things that say 
another hallmark of this process during these days is that victims of a wrong, if they really believe the apology you're giving, if they really believe it's sincere, then they should forgive. So that's an interesting twist there. And it all ends on the day that we said called Yom Kippur. So that's the real day of atonement. Now, on that day, folks are atoning for the misdeeds of the past year, as we said, against God. Because by then, right, you've already apologized to the other people in those preceding days, and that judgment gets sealed. But you can have this chance to try one more time on Yom Kippur to to find leniency, to make your case. So people fast on Yom Kippur and and they go to temple. And it's a time to go inside, not just inside the synagogue building, but to go inside the self, to think, to connect. It's all very personal and very communal at the same time. It reminds me, when I read about it and think about it, it reminds me of group meditation, where people all come together, but it's very much inward focused. So like I said, that all recently concluded. I think Yom Kippur was on September 19th in 2018 here, or for our Jewish friends around the world, then it would be 5779. So all of this has been going on for a lot of years, this cycle of life, misdeed, and repentance. But what does it mean for us today in modern times? We can certainly look at this as a concrete decree set down by God in the Bible. So it's in Leviticus. So that's chapter 16, verse 29. If you're interested and you want to look up the biblical origins of Yom Kippur. But no matter what background we come from, how we were raised, or what we value, we can also look at this powerful time of year as a chance to focus our energy on what really matters, getting right with ourselves, getting right with our lives, getting right with others, getting right with whatever we believe the highest power or our highest goals are. If we think about that word atonement in the day of atonement, we know it It means making good on a wrong, making amends. Maybe you think of people repaying debts or a descendant in a family line apologizing for the sins of the parent. For our Christian friends out there, they may think of Christ's suffering and death at the end of his life as as a form of atonement for the sins of, of humankind. It's up to you how you want to think about that word. But in many ways, it's taken on a very heavy connotation. But if you look closely at the word, It actually looks like at one meant. The dictionary says a condition of being at one with others. When we look at it in that way, the word softens out of being a harsh decree that almost sounds like punishment into a powerful metaphor for the power of treating ourselves, treating each other with a little more gentleness and kindness. That makes the phrase atonement for sins a little easier to handle. When we think of sin as another strong word. We often think of a wrong, something that brings the energy of a relationship down. I guess it's something that in some ways also brings the energy of the world down, right? But when we commit ourselves to sincere apologies or making a repayment of some kind, we can repair that damage and bring energies together, raise them up. We stitch together the tears we create and unify experience again. And let's not forget about the power of forgiveness. Look, folks, in this world, there's no shortage of things to forgive. There's a good chance someone will will swindle us. Many of us will be the victim of of a theft. It can come in forms and from people we least expect. Or maybe it happens at a time we don't anticipate or from someone we never thought would steal from us. And sometimes we have to learn to forgive and let go because carrying those burdens is just too heavy. And forgiveness repairs a tear the same way, I guess the same way a stitch mends fabric or glue mends a broken item. Often, we can see where the damage was. We can feel a bump or see a diversion in the perfect pattern that was once there. But it's a repair. A stitch or a dab of glue can can take something that was once damaged and make it useful again. And this time of year, that's worth thinking about in your own life whether you're Jewish or not. If you're holding on to a grudge that's, I don't know, we were breaking your, your life in some way or a relationship, think about a repair. You may just find it adds to the character and story of what was once broken. That may not be the case for you, but you might be surprised. The importance of forgiving and apologizing, that all 
got me thinking that maybe there are other ways to unify and create a sense of at one with those we've wronged or who have wronged us. Maybe it's as simple as meditating and seeing the person in light and asking for their spiritual forgiveness. Maybe we send prayers of apology and well-being as a gift and sign of good faith. Do you think that works? Is that, is that something you do? Well, I've heard there are people all over the planet who sit quietly and meditate on the well-being of others. They don't advertise it or put it out on social media. They just do it. Some in monasteries, some in caves, some in their living room. They don't expect rewards or a thumbs up. They just want to help us all repair the rifts in the world. We all probably benefit from their efforts, but because we don't see it or don't know who they are, we don't really appreciate it as much as the people we see bustling about and doing good deeds in a five cents world. But the point is, maybe energy can be as powerful as physical action. Look, if you're listening to this show, I probably don't have to convince you about energy. You know when you see people talking to each other in a loving way, it makes you feel better, even if you don't know who they are. And when you see people yelling at each other, tearing each other down, criticizing each other, losing their patience with each other, it creates feelings of darkness and sadness to the people who witness it. You see how anger and negativity create rifts that you can, you can feel and how watching people be loving can make you feel better. Now, that's a form of repair, right? And you know when you meet certain people, they radiate warmth. They didn't, they didn't do anything necessarily, but it's the way they look at you, something in the way they are. They aren't nice to you because the playbook of human interaction says to be nice. They genuinely wish you well and mean it, you know, even when you turn your back. So with that idea of power, of po the power of positive energy in mind, we can take this idea of atonement a step further. Or if you want to think about it differently, a step back. What if we went through life with an atonement mindset even before the wrong occurs? Now, I don't mean we walk around with our heads down in, in, in shame or guilt before we've done anything wrong. I mean, what if we held our heads high as we went through life and thought about ways to prevent the wrong from happening in the first place. Now, I'm not saying we can all be saints. I, I'm suggesting that we put certain principles first in our mind. If we snap at people generally, maybe we stop, think about the rift that creates, and we're less snippy. If we berate people when they disappoint us because they didn't read our mind in a situation, Maybe we try to see things from their perspective, the expectations they have as being the reason for their anger. If we are impatient with others and expect nothing but the patience of saints from others, maybe we try to work on ourselves first and interact with love towards others first and not expecting it back as a precursor. And maybe when it comes to the small stuff, we're quick to forgive. A friend is 15 minutes late to dinner, start there, practice there, it's okay. Someone owes you money and hasn't paid it back? It's a little more difficult, but consider it charity. Trust me, divine justice will take care of it. But for the big stuff, well, that's something for you to decide. But for the small stuff, leave the house each day ready to forgive. Find out where that takes you. See, one of the best ways to repair a rift is to never let it happen in the first place. And if we put out an energy that is kind, patient, forgiving, loving, we can go a long way to healing not only our world, but the worlds of others as well. Look, we're not perfect. We never will be. But perfection wasn't made to be achieved. It was made to be something we strive for. And as we come out of these days of awe, maybe we can do two things. No matter who we are, what religion we follow, doesn't matter. One, try our best to repair relationships that need it by doing some good old-fashioned mending. Okay, whatever glue or stitch you use. And two, Go into the world with a mindset that gives us the best chance of avoiding rifts in the first place, a mindset of repair. It doesn't matter what your religion is. What matters is that you are part of the human fabric and when you tear it, you feel it. That means you're responsible not only for mending the places you tear, but for being gentler and kinder so that the tears don't happen in the first place. Check us out at the nobodyguidetolife.com or you can reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook at Nobody's View. 
or join the Facebook community, Simple Spirituality. If you like what you hear on this podcast, please take a moment to subscribe or leave a review. We'd really appreciate it. Keep practicing and have a good week.